good afternoon, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. This is our last distinguished seminar for the year. And I am very pleased that we have Dr. Greg Chemitoff with us. He is at Texas A&M right now. I'll go through his, bio his biography because I'm actually going to read the whole thing because it's very cool. Um, so, well, originally from Montreal, Canada. Um, but he has been a Na or was a Na NASA astronaut for 15 years, including shuttle missions STS-124, 126, 134, and space station long-duration missions, Expedition 17 and 18. And I think you're going to show a bunch of videos from those various... Okay. Some is better than a lot, I guess, but, okay. So he lived and worked in space for almost 200 days as a flight engineer, science officer, and mission specialist. And then his last mission was on the final flight of the space shuttle Endeavor. And I swear I saw a video of that one in the deck. Yes, okay, good. Um, and so he performed two spacewalks and then last one of the shuttle era, um, which also completed the assembly of the ISS. And so currently he is the William Keeler 49 Chair Professor of Practice in Aerospace Engineering. And we discuss this a lot. That's a lot like a, a mashup between our teaching and research faculty. Um, so he does both teach and research. And uh, Director of the Aerospace Technology Research and Operations Lab, ASTRO at Texas A&M. Co-author and co-editor of Human Spaceflight Operations, which is a textbook on the lessons learned from the past 60 years of spaceflight does research on space robotics, <clears throat> autonomous systems, and development of collaborative virtual simulation environments for space system engineering and mission design. I think you're gonna tell us about all of that, which will I'm be excellent. <laughs> all right, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. And um, I know there's a lot of you online, so welcome. And um, I'm really uh, I'm excited to be here. So yeah, we're going to be talking about this. Um, this is a platform called Space Teams that we've been developing for about eight years, and uh, it is a digital twin of the whole space environment or uh, simulation. And I'm going to just skip this for the, for a moment and talk a little more about uh, um, just being here with you and a little bit about my background, and then we'll get back to this. So, all right. So first of all, uh, this was just was yesterday, right? Um, Alvar and I were at the uh, Museum of Flight. And we found, uh, we found the spheres there, which is uh, really exciting because this is something. So my, one of my connections to UW is uh, that Alvar is here. I'm very excited that you have him with you guys now. Uh, we worked a no for a number of years together on uh, the satellite operations and the space station with these robots called spheres, which Alvar designed. And I think a lot of you know that. And, um, and uh, um, we also started a STEM program with that. And, and so uh, we got to kick off that STEM program in space. We talked about it during my first mission. We finally got to kick it off during the second mission. And this was the, big, this was the MIT's 150th and also the kickoff of the Spheres competition, this, the Zero Robotics competition. A uh, very exciting thing. This is run worldwide. All the countries that are involved in the space station program participate in this. Uh, while, uh, while these events that were happening in the US, there were similar events happening in Europe and also in Australia and other places. Uh, where students are programming these robots on the space station and then competing, and the crew on board, um, uh, at one time me uh, and then others, uh, running the, running the, the students' uh, algorithms on the space station. So it's a lot of fun. Um, we've had a lot of fun doing cool things in space over a long time, and I'm sure that my reason for being here today has something to do with Alvar, so thank you for the invitation. All right. Um, Back up. This is the other reason that I'm here. My son is uh, at UW now as a freshman. Um, this is the freshman boat, and he's in the top freshman boat, which is very exciting. It's a dream come true for him. He's right there at the bow. And this was on Saturday, so it just so happened this weekend. I, we had no idea when you invited me. I had no idea this weekend had anything to do with this, but it got turned out to be the same weekend. So we got to see him race in Windermere. And so this is a really big weekend for me, and, and uh, I'm very excited to, to be here. All right, so um, I'd like to start off a little bit with this, this picture. Uh, this, this picture is uh, a moment, um, a very special moment for me. Uh, it's during a spacewalk. Uh, this is me during that spacewalk, and my crew, it's kind of maybe hard for you all to see uh, from the size of it, but my crewmate is taking that, and he's reflected in my visor. And um, this was the very last spacewalk of Space Station Assembly. It just so happened we were the ones on that spacewalk. And we got to announce from this exact spot you see in the picture here, basically that space station assembly was complete. And uh, so a fantastic moment. We're kind of congratulating all the control centers around the world. 
And, um, and this was kind of the highest place you could climb up to. It's on top of a, a, a spares rack that's sticking up on the truss. And so we saw this in virtual reality. We were actually training in virtual reality. We're up there going, oh my God, this is gonna be amazing. We have to bring in the right camera and the right lens to capture this, so we did. Um, so it's a very wide angle lens. So this radiator panel is nowhere as big as it looks. Um, and this is about 360 feet long, the truss. Um, almost that, a little bit less in the, in the other direction. So that's really compressed in the horizontal. Uh, but you can see the shuttle sticking up here and the station robotic arm. And uh, this is the Russian side of the space station. This is probably the view you're more familiar with. And uh, we were installing, as part of this mission, a, a very expensive experiment, a $2 billion cosmic ray detector called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which was <laughs> over here on the other side of the truss. Uh, anyway, a fantastic moment. Um, but, you know, the, but the exciting thing for me was that I started working on this when I was a grad student, like many of you guys who are here and also uh, on Zoom today. Um, I was working on the guidance and control system for the space station as a, as a grad student. It was a very challenging problem because every time a new piece went up, the space station configuration was different, the power configuration was different, the GNC system had different inertias to work with, um, and so it was a constantly evolving design. We also had the Russian uh, side of the space station, actually not quite at that time, but eventually the Russian side of the space station with the control of the thrusters and us with the gyros. And um, so I got to work on this as a grad student and then eventually got to be there for this last mission uh, to basically declare that the assembly of the space station was, was complete. Um, by the way, uh, like to, to us, this is for you guys, maybe this is just a PowerPoint slide, but you know, this is a, this is a moment for a person. Um, and, but it was a PowerPoint slide you know, to many, many years ago. I found the slide. <laughs> so this is the PowerPoint slide when we were thinking about building this thing. And you know, we didn't have PowerPoint <laughs> then or anything else that was really uh, useful like we have today. And in fact, you can see like the reason these, these look this way is they were photocopied a million times and handed out and photocopied and handed out and photocopied. And um, so those were our slides in the day. And this was the design of Space Station Freedom before the Russians were actually involved in, in the final configuration. Anyway, so I just want to give you a little background on myself uh, going, going uh, way back, but I'll come, I'll come forward very quickly. Um, so a picture of hopefully you recognize Mission Control. And um, this was in the Apollo, um, you know, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo era. And I was in Montreal, as um, uh, Christy was saying. I was born in Montreal. I was, I was um, watching this unfold with my father, who was an engineer. And he was just absolutely amazed by the space program. And he saw guys like this, thinking, how do those guys have that job? It's got to be the coolest job in the world. How, how do they get to do that? Uh, many years later, this is when I was uh, uh, watching that with him. And I wasn't working for NASA yet at that time. Um, and then many years later, I was and got to work in Mission Control. And that's kind of what Mission Control looks like now. Um, in fact, in this picture, you can see a few positions. This, this is, uh, if you can see it, that person right there, right here, that's a Capcom position. And uh, that's a flight director right there. Um, the, the, uh, that Capcom is my crewmate, uh, Mike Fink. And he's the one who took that picture of me that I just showed you on the previous page uh, during that spacewalk. And he's uh, Capcom right now. So we, we always have the crew uh, as Capcoms or as much as possible because the crew crew knows what the other crew knows and how to say things, you know, in a way that the crew member will understand. Um, in any case, um, the other thing that happened at this time when I was really young, we, we were living in Montreal, like I said, we would go to Florida for vacation sometimes, just happened to see this launch. You know, oh, maybe you know which one this is, but that's Apollo 11, the Saturn V, we got to see this launch. And again, I was six years old, but um, when I saw that, that was it for me. That's all I wanted to do. Every English teacher had to suffer with my writing about space, you know, all the way through. And um, so here I am with my little brother. Um, and, uh, and then again, many years later, another launch, another trip uh, visiting uh, the Cape. And then uh, skipping ahead really fast. So now a freshman year in college, and this happened. So this was 1981, January, the shuttle launched for the first time. I watched this from the, my dorm. And uh, uh, up until that point, I didn't know what I could possibly do to make this come true. But on that day, the day after this, I called NASA. And if you try to call, if, is anybody here? Has anybody applied? How recent, did you, oh, my, terrific. OK, yeah. So they just had a recent selection. Did you just submit, send it in? OK, very cool. And, 
And so, you know, there's a person who runs that office, the astronaut selection office is a manager. I mean, I literally called NASA and spoke to the <clears throat> manager of the astronaut selection office, which you can do. And, um, and they'll talk to you and give you advice. And uh, that turned out to be the person on the committee many, many years later who was actually there for when I was selected. But at this time, that's me at the time, basically. And uh, four years later, at, our, at my graduation, just so happened that uh, Hoot Gibson uh, came and spoke at my graduation. I was at Cal Poly uh, undergrad. He was from Cal Poly. He spoke at the graduation, and I got to meet him. And that was the first time I met somebody had done this. And so that, that made me feel like I've, maybe somehow I'm on the right track. He came from the same school, maybe it's possible. Fast forward again, many years, uh, the astronaut class of 17, I'm hiding in the back here. And, um, and then the training started. So I'll tell you just a little bit about the training. Uh, this was the first training flight that I had. <laughs> you don't believe it? You, you don't see me here? I was younger, you just look hard, you'll find me. All right, let me zoom in for you. Okay. <laughs> oh, so this was uh, obviously a Paramount set, which was fantastic. Uh, uh, so the NASA had an arrangement with Paramount to do um, uh, some promotional things and so part of that was to fly this phaser in space and so they gave it to me to put in my personal items. I was very happy to volunteer to do that. Uh, so we had that phaser on, this, on the, the space shuttle and the space station and then I brought it back and uh, on the set while they were filming I got to hand it to J.J. Abrams and talk to the whole crew on the bridge of the Enterprise which was really weird because they're all in character, we're on the bridge and, you know, if, as I grew up watching Star Trek with my dad, if I ever could envision, like, meeting the crew, I would never imagine them listening to me. <laughs> I mean, they all stopped at what they were doing, and, the, and, and um, I was telling them how much they were an inspiration to me, which was really, really neat. All right, so real missions. Uh, this was uh, STS-124. It was the delivery of the Japanese experiment module, which is the most beautiful laboratory we have on the space station, the biggest laboratory. Uh, we brought that up. This is the, that's a representation of it there with the, uh, the red dot with the Japanese flag. And uh, Aki here was a Japanese crew member, but he was a shuttle crew member. Uh, I was going to be staying for a long duration. They were dropping me off. And so uh, I actually had a lot more training to work with it and start the science program. And basically it's a big IKEA set. Set everything up, start the science program, get it going. And so uh, I got to do that for six months and live with their brand new spaceship, which was awesome. Um, the European module was already up at the time, so basically the U.S. program, the, the, the European program, and the Japanese program, those were more or less my responsibility. There were two Russians on board at the time, and, you know, they took care of the Russian side of the space station. Um, so, uh, uh, Yuri and, and Oleg here. And, um, and then uh, there was a change of crew, so uh, Soyuz came up. Um, the, the Russians that I was with went down, uh, a few others came up, and... Um, uh, there's Mike again, so he came up, and um, um, there was the three of us, and then another change of crew, a shuttle came up, and then Sag, uh, Sandy here swapped out with me, and I, came, I went back down with the crew of uh, 126. Uh, then we had another flight a few years later, back to the space station. This is the one where I showed you the picture at the beginning. Uh, this was the flight to finish assembly of the space station and bring up this cosmic ray detector. And, um, you know, we get a formal picture like this, but there's always an informal picture. I didn't show you the informal picture from the other one. But, um, um, and I don't know if you'll recognize that configuration, but maybe you kind of do. Um, now you'll recognize it in a second here, so. <laughs> and they did a pretty good job lining us up. Um, this, we're missing a very attractive communication officer, or attractive anybody, but <laughs> it's a pretty good, pretty good lineup. All right, so. Um, for that last mission, I'm going to share, share a video of that mission with you guys uh, just to get a sense of what it's like to be there. Uh, beautiful, absolutely beautiful on the launch pad. The shuttle's spectacular, especially at night. It's kind of a special trip out there to see it lit up at night. It's only, only the last you know, 24, 48 hours you can see it like this. Otherwise, it's covered by this uh, shroud, which is basically uh, rolled in here, and it covers the payload bay so the payload bay can be open. It can be working in there and configuring everything and um, then it rolls back um, and it's ready to launch. Well, we didn't launch, we had a problem on the first flight and that was unfortunate because we invited the Obama family to come see the launch and so they were there and we were the booby prize instead of the launch they got to meet us because we were in quarantine and after the launch failed, we were already in a launch pad, went through the whole thing, had to get back out and come back to the quarantine. Uh, but we got to meet the, the Obama family and uh, these are my kids. 
um, and my wife um, uh, meeting the Obama family, which was really, really cool. Um, Dimitri's gotten a little taller since then, <laughs> my son. Um, and, um, and here they are watching, watching the launch when it actually went. Uh, this is a couple weeks later. And the funny thing about this launch was that, uh, were you at this one, the, the 134 one, or maybe only the other one? The 124 one, yeah. So at this one, it was really strange. You can't, I don't know if you can really tell, but this, this layer of clouds here was, was pretty solid. So 11 seconds after launch, the shuttle disappeared through those clouds, and everyone watching from the ground, that was it. They saw the billow of smoke go up into the clouds. Um, but there, was F, there were F-15s patrolling the airspace around, keeping everybody away you know, from the launch pad, and they captured this picture, which is just amazing. Uh, so we were at the tip of that uh, flame right there, and there's also a picture with the F-15 in the, in the view, which is, I found that only recently, the second picture. So very cool. All right, so let me show you this video, and then we'll switch to some uh, research topics.
All right, so a little bit of a, a segue here into um, uh, current, current work, um, but something that's in mission control now and has been in mission control for a long time. So when not training for a mission, uh, this is something that I was working on at NASA. Uh, it's called Bird's Eye View, and it's in mission control on the main screen. Uh, it has different views. Uh, this was basically a digital twin, but it was long before anybody used the word digital twin. There was no such thing as a digital twin, and, uh, but essentially that was the function. Uh, so what this was basically was a, a situation awareness tool for mission control. They could see what was going on with the space station. At that time, we basically said, look, you know, we don't want a 21st century. This was before the year 2000. So we don't want a 21st century vehicle to be looking at yaw pitch roll numbers on a display. We should be able to see graphically what our orientation is, where we are around the planet, where the satellites are, where the sun is, where the ground stations are. And so... And everybody should have that, that situation awareness. Um, so this is actually on board the space station. It's in mission control. It's actually in most of the control centers around the world, in Canada, in Germany, and in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, some of the payload control centers. And, um, and what it is, is it's essentially a, a simulation. It can predict. It can watch the telemetry and show you what's going on. Uh, it also can predict and say, well, if we lost telemetry, this is what should be happening right now, based on mode, the mode that things were in, um, based on what we were doing. And uh, so this has actually been in there. This was built by students. Um, the students that built this were students that were working at, at Texas A&M. I had grad students that I was supervising from NASA. And so all the, under, all the code underneath for ground track and everything else uh, was all done by students. And this was, the, this was, high, this was great graphics at the time. <laughs> it's not, not so, so amazing anymore. And so what we're doing now with NASA, is kind of, it's, it was not really intended as an extension of this, but now we're back working with NASA on what's next, what they need now for Artemis and beyond, for Gateway, for anything going further out. We need a tool like this to monitor what's going on in space and for all the different disciplines in the control center to be able to set up a display to monitor a particular system, to monitor a, an operation that's going on, um, even to put themselves into that situation in VR to look around and see what's actually happening if we have the data to track humans or, or rovers or robots. And uh, so we are basically building that. Uh, it's called Space Teams. We've been working on it for about eight years at Texas A&M. A lot of it is sponsored by NASA. It's also sponsored by uh, SimDynamics. It's also sponsored by some uh, NSF grants. And, um, and it basically is a digital twin of the whole space environment so that the environment is super accurate as well as the systems and models that go into any particular end-to-end uh, -end mission scenario or, or ops concept. So you can put an entire ops concept in here and evaluate it and you can also adjust the parameters of that and try to optimize it and I'll, I'll say more about that. Uh, so this is what we're doing and so that's what Space Teams basically is and uh, it's not, so it's not just 
um, it's similar in that it, it, it's, the intent is that it could be following telemetry and are just watching what's going on. And you could say, okay, let me, let me see what's happening in the spacewalk on the space station. Let me see what's happening with, on Gateway. Let me see what's happening on a descent vehicle or a, or a, a, a robotic uh, activity that's going on on the moon, all in the same sim. Uh, all getting data, you know, and, and certain things could ha have LOS, loss of data, and they're being predicted while other things are getting live data. And different uh, disciplines could be watching whatever part that they're actually interested in, monitoring the data, monitoring um, the operations. And when something goes wrong, then the different, different disciplines can pull up their problem reports and flight rules and data books and look at, okay, how are we going to react to the situation, interact together and do the decision making and mission control. So, the ultimate goal of this from the NASA perspective is a decision-making real-time tool for operations. Uh, but also it's for planning and training because it's virtual reality. You can, you can set up a scenario, jump into that scenario, and run a whole uh, uh, practical thing with a crew in training in, in VR um, with failures and things like that. So this is happening in my lab at A&M, the Astro Lab. And, um, and one of the reasons we've been able to do this is because we have a research uh, undergraduate course that allows undergrads to participate in, in, in uh, different research projects that could be industry sponsored, they could be um, something like this, which is not really uh, sponsored by industry directly, but, um, but in any case, the, it has funding to cover some of the work that's going on. And we usually have about 60 undergrads in that every semester. So it's a fantastic opportunity for them. They're working on different teams and, and, um, and, um, and building capabilities to do this, this kind of thing. So at any one time, we have that many students. And uh, in total, over eight years, we've had about 500 undergraduate projects and graduate projects uh, contribute to this. Uh, this is the team. I just want to highlight um, the students in my lab. Uh, these are grad students, mostly in the top. Um, and um, undergraduates who are also who've been with this project for long enough, they're, they're, they're team leads, and other undergraduates work under them. And uh, so we cover all these different areas and, and more. There's been other topics as well, but this is just, I'm not going to go through these, but just many different topics required to like kind of pull this off. Environmental modeling, system modeling, um, uh, the displays, the working with the backend networking and um, uh, authorization, so a lot of software and, uh, uh, background, optimization, robotics, there's all kinds of uh, projects within these different categories that have gone on through that time. Um, just to, uh, again, another eye chart, I suppose, uh, this is just some of the research that's related to this that we've been doing. Uh, maybe just highlight a few of these. The second one, Mission Operations Digital Twin, this is kind of what I've been alluding to with NASA, basically, to have a digital twin for mission control, which is a current ongoing project. A lot of this has had to do with rendering the environment is in real time. We want the simulation to be real time or much faster than real time, as I'll talk about. Uh, and so that has been a big part of it, is to be able to put you know, the best possible data of planetary surfaces and perfect lighting, correct lighting, correct physics, correct atmospheres um, into, uh, uh, the, for, for the environment. So when you put your models into the environment, it's experiencing you know, the intended environment. Um, uh, a few other things I'll mention, so that there was uh, some, some part of this that you'll, I'll, I'll mention later too, is uh, optimization. So trying to design, uh, like for planning a mission, you know, every aspect of that mission is sort of could be a parameter, and this whole tool is set up that, um, you know, when you go, what uh, any device that's involved could have some parameters that are part of its design that could be uh, possibly optimized. And then operations can be optimized. So what are, you know, what are your operational roles? What, are the, what, what aspects of the operations are? Uh, something like what time of day are you going to leave for the EVA? That could, that could affect things, uh, those kind of parameters. Um, any operational or, or, or design parameter can be counted as a parameter in a Monte Carlo analysis to figure out uh, the best design or the best mission or the best assets for a set of tasks for a mission. Um, and we have some other research projects that are directly related to this or are being used in this, like the vision-based navigation. NASA is very keen now about how are we going to navigate on the lunar surface when we're there, but also for landers, how are we going to navigate as we approach. Um, and so uh, this is a PhD uh, project that's sponsored by NASA. Um, and um, uh, let me just mention this one as well, because this is kind of a very interesting aspect of this that uh, when, you, when you put models or spacecraft models or components or systems together into this tool, uh, those, those models interact. So if there's a power system, a be the best example is like a spacecraft with, let's say, a, 
um, an atmospheric scrubber, oxygen generator, and crew. And if two modules are connected and the, and the, and the hatch is open and the carbon dioxide scrubber is running over there and the crew is over here, there's a certain diffusion of carbon dioxide and oxygen you know, in the atmosphere. If you close the hatch, that'll obviously be different. Carbon dioxide will build up here because the scrubber is over there. Um, the system knows that. It knows how pieces are connected as you put models together. It can, it can you know, track power, you know, thermal um, uh, composition of gases, and, um, and all these things as, you, as a network of resources with every piece that's connected or connected dynamically within a simulation. Um, and uh, there's a big STEM component of this. It's been a fantastic platform to, to run STEM programs on, and um, so I'll, I'll mention some of that as well. Um, Anyway, just a picture of uh, some of the some of the one of the classes, um, and um, you know, uh, presenting their their weekly progress or whatever. Uh, so I have a video to show you to explain what this is that can do a better job than me uh, with words. But um, essentially, uh, there's several things that you, that it's designed to do. So first of all, it's a it's a virtual mission design tool. So the idea is you can integrate all the all aspects of your design. So if you have robots or spacecraft or system components in a, uh, as part of a habitat or whatever it is. Uh, you can bring those models in, the physical models, if, even if it has moving parts. You can bring those in. You can bring in you know, the models of the dynamics if you've coded those up yourself. Um, and we, all, we have a lot of models in here already, for example, sensors and actuators that you may use, cameras that you can configure. Um, uh, the space physics in here may or may not be good enough for you. We've got really high order models for uh, the physics of the environment, orbital mechanics, and, and so on. But um, if you had a specific physics for a particular atmosphere of a particular planet or something, you may want to replace our model uh, or, or put a model in where we don't have one. Um, and as I mentioned, we can use this for optimization. And I'll kind of get around to that a little bit uh, more. Um, uh, so mission planning and simulation, as I've said, uh, in order to do that, you have to be able to manage events. So uh, this is sort of, the, sort of an event-based simulation, not a time-based simulation that you say go and leave overnight and check the results in the morning. Uh, in this case, it could be human in the loop. People could be in VR. Uh, they could be in different locations participating in a simulation together. Uh, so someone could be in Russia participating in a joint simulation, you know, in the same simulation as others in Houston, for example. Um, but events can include failures or events based on something a crew does. If a crew flips a switch, obviously, that may turn something on. That, that's an event. Um, uh, failures and things like that. Uh, and we want this to run in real time because, it's a, it's, first of all, it's going to be running in, uh, without, with real-time operations, but also in training it has to be real-time. And um, so the model fidelity here is that the fidelity we can, we can get results in real-time. So you can't run CFD you know, models in something like this. Um, so the, um, but uh, we do want to be able to run headless, which means like without the graphics, uh, if, if it's not human in the loop, very, very fast. So we can run multiple possibilities and the mission control can make decisions by looking at options and choosing between possibilities that are in parallel being evolved by the simulation. Um, and when we, uh, which I just said, and when, and when, we, when you do that, you need performance metrics and you can define them. So. Uh, whatever those are for your particular uh, task or mission, you can define those and, um, and analyze them. Um, I mentioned training and failures and, um, and real-time operations and so on. So, all right, so let me show you this quick video, which does a better job of explaining it than I can, actually, and uh, you'll have a good idea after. Space Teams is a platform and a new paradigm that enables anyone to collaborate on aerospace systems and mission design. Space Teams provides a high fidelity virtual environment of anywhere in the solar system for the design, simulation, testing, and analysis of human in the loop multi-user missions. It can be used for strategic planning, operator training, scenario-based analysis, and to support real-time operations, including situational awareness as well as virtual engagement. The Space Team's vision is to enable scientists, engineers, and students to share ideas and to contribute to humanity's future in space, while government, industry, and academia can collaborate on open or secure aerospace programs. With high fidelity, mathematically accurate models of real physical systems, Space Teams provides the tools for engineers and operators to evaluate their systems in a precise virtual version of the intended environment. 
Space Team simulations can also import any user-provided models, such as CAD, environment models, or system behaviors or algorithms, to create virtually any mission scenario imaginable. In industry, it is often difficult to have different engineering teams collaborate on a single platform. The use of different software platforms often requires the work be redone or simplified. Space Teams avoids these issues by providing the interfaces and integration of all necessary files and tools in one package, including industry standards like NASA SPICE ephemeri data and APIs for Python, C++, TRIC, ROS, MATLAB, and other programming languages. Users can plug in their own models or algorithms while Space Teams provides a precision operational environment. In this example, the Earth, Orbital Mechanics, Attitude Sensor, and Camera models, as well as Thruster Performance, is all provided by Space Teams, while the customer has plugged in their guidance navigation and control algorithms. Space Teams is also compatible with multi-user, human-in-the-loop simulations, as well as operations. Mission planning and analysis can be done fully virtually, saving time and money, and that the same capabilities carry over to the actual mission. From the cockpit, spacesuit, habitat, or mission control, all operators maintain situational awareness through mixed reality interfaces, such as displays, AR, or VR. In this simulation at the rim of Shackleton Crater, the accuracy of the lunar terrain, solar lighting, and deep shadows make it possible to experience realistic operational conditions. Inside of the habitat, or in the spacesuits or in the rover, resource models are tracking utilization, storage, and generation of all resources, such as power, water, and oxygen. The mission environment is rendered seamlessly within the rest of the solar system. A user can travel anywhere and discover the other events that are happening elsewhere, simultaneously, and within the same simulation. Space Teams hopes to spur creativity and innovation by providing a simple way to design, build, and test models for current and future space missions. Users, teams, organizations, and assets can all have different licenses and authorizations with customizable permissions at each level. Space Teams provides interface for collaboration, allowing teams from different companies and sectors to work together on the same project. What's possible is only limited by the user's ingenuity. Space Teams Academy is a STEM version of Space Teams that is targeted for middle and high school students. The Academy version encourages innovation and teamwork through a virtual competition to design and execute the best mission to another world. Thousands of students from 15 countries around the world have already participated, and a NASA-funded grant plans to reach more than 10,000 students within the next few years. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you starside. I'm hoping to get you excited about the possibility of using this for your applications here, collaborating. You guys have access to this. I'll show you how, and um, but I'll, I'll tell you more about it. So, um, so I mentioned a little bit about optimization, um, and in this case, this is a project here to optimize uh, an excavation and um, and uh, and search for uh, where to do excavation on the lunar surface. And uh, this project uh, recently got completed, and now we kind of have a next phase of this. Uh, but basically, there's assets on the moon, robotic assets, uh, excavators, um, trucks that are moving regolith to a processing station. There's charging stations for the robots. They all have uh, autonomous tasks that they're doing. There's crew involved. Uh, the crew's out there with other robots that are doing sampling, regolith sampling. And, um, and they're trying to figure out where is the next place we're going to do excavation um, when the, the current site is used up. And uh, so we are also putting a, f now we're putting kind of failures in this, where, for example, there's a problem with a wheel on one of these uh, robots or the, the LTV, which the crew needs to get back to the habitat. It could be a situation where the crew can't get back or, uh, very easily by foot, given the resources they have left. And the choice is, do we try to fix the wheel, um, or, or does a crew have to come out from the habitat on another one and rescue everybody and come back another day to fix the, uh, the, this called an LTV? And so that's kind of what scenario that we're working with, uh, that, with NASA on as an example. And so the idea is that you know, people in mission control are looking at this, they're looking at the data they can access on all their systems and try to figure out, okay, what's the decision based on the resources available, the, the lighting, the communication situation, um, and how long it's gonna take to run procedures and so on. Um, 
So I'm just going to show you a quick video that kind of lays out the geometry here. So this is the peak of eternal light near, the, near Shackleton Crater. Um, there's a habitat there. And, um, and uh, a little further away from the habitat, uh, there's some um, places where the excavation is going on. Uh, the, speed, the speed of this will speed up and slow down, so it'll look a little funny, but just to make it shorter. Um, so there's an excavator in this, uh, what's called a PSR, right? You may know about the, the um, um, permanently shadowed region. Uh, it's sped up now. The trucks are moving toward an excavator, which is going to fill them up. And when they're done, they go off to a processing station. And over in the other area, um, different direction from the habitat, they're exploring a new PSR. Um, and here they've got um, uh, the sampling rover with them. And they're going to be walking around and, and sampling the regolith. And their, their mission, uh, their daily mission is to gather as many samples as they can at the, 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 the regions they wanted to explore, bring those back for analysis to help figure out where to do the next excavation. And so this is all happening on the south pole of the moon. And um, so that's, uh, that's that scenario. And as an example, and this is a notional display, but uh, just as an example, there could be you know, different scenarios here. Um, that, that occur, and based on those scenarios, there could be different uh, event sequences that you need to want to look at, different parameters of the design or the operations you want to be able to vary, and, uh, and then different performance metrics that you are choosing for optimization. So this is basically a big Monte Carlo run, or it could be parameterized a set of, set of values for, uh, like stepwise values for some of these parameters, of numerical ones. And, um, and in the end, you're generating you know, plots and can figure out what was the optimal solution, and, and then that's your, that's your path forward. So that's kind of the idea. Um, this simulation here, I'm going to show you, this, this was intended for the DOD, but it's a good example, basically showing uh, the continuity uh, that we've put into this so that it really everything in the solar system is connected. You could have operations going on anywhere. In fact, the scaling. Uh, could be dramatic. There's no limit, and I'll explain that later, of how many uh, entities could be involved. But the, the Earth model is very, very accurate. The, the, the data is um, uh, high fidelity data for the Earth's surface. There's even scattering in the atmosphere that's calculated in real time. Uh, this is just showing that you could be, there could be some assets on the ground and in, in, in the air. Uh, they, believe it or not, the Air Force is not, for their battle simulations, they do not have, they have a flat Earth in their simulations. They, they need to incorporate the battle space you know, above the, obviously in orbit, the satellites coming over, but their, their simulations do not include, um, and properly include the space environment. And so we essentially could have satellites, uh, ground assets, air assets at different levels, all in the same simulation. Uh, this is just an example coming into the Hubble telescope. It's a little jerky because the person flying the camera is just flying it manually. but. Um, you know, so you can have any assets in space, you know, as well as on the ground. And then just for fun here, it's going to zoom out further and then fly into the moon. And um, with the idea of showing that you know, there could be things happening on the moon, things happening on the space station, things happening on the surface, and they're all in the same environment, um, which is all being propagated and with correct uh, position of everything, correct lighting for everything. And I think I'll... I'll uh, skip ahead here because it's going to basically fly into the habitat that we just saw um, a minute ago. So I'll, I'll just skip ahead a little bit. All right, so we've hooked this up to hardware. This is, a real, this is where it gets fun. Um, so you, this, we call this the hamster ball. Uh, you can be in here with a VR headset. And um, uh, this is actually, this unit is at the University of Sydney where I also have an appointment. And, um, and so we've hooked this up to space teams. So we have uh, basically a lunar lander model in here, which you can see landing here next to the habitat on the uh, other side. And so um, we're going to hook up a lunar rover, and it could also be uh, any vehicle you want to fly or, or operate. Um, and um, so this, we're getting one in, at Texas a as well. And the cool thing is going to be, well, here's what I want to see. I told the team that I want somebody in Australia to be driving the rover, the LTV, and I'll be in a spacesuit on the, on the lunar south pole. And their job is to run me over. And I'm in, I'm in Texas, they're in Australia. When you can run me over from Australia, then OK, we've, we've, we've accomplished a, something. Um, all right, so uh, finally I want to mention the STEM program, because this has been amazing. We've been running this around the world now. There's been uh, thousands of students, um, and it's growing quickly. Um, so this was run as, as a competition. We've had teams in different countries. And 
Uh, essentially, they run through the sequence. These are sort of canned events built on space teams. Um, they build a space station, a spacecraft that has to accomplish a mission, bring them to another planet. Uh, has to have a Delta V that works. It has to carry resources enough for the crew on board. Um, and it's kind of an AI guidance thing in there. So as they build their spacecraft, they can do like mini simulations. It'll tell them, hey, um, uh, power looks good, but you're going to run out of water in 14 minutes. So you better do something about the water. So they do something about the water, and then, oh, that's great, but you're going to run out of oxygen in you know, 200 days, and you need 700 days or whatever. And, um, and so uh, it keeps going like that until they iterate on the design that works, and they're getting scored, and they're competing against other teams on a, on a leaderboard. And, um, but they do their, all the orbital mechanics. This is middle school kids as well as high school kids. They do all the orbital mechanics to get all the way to this planetary body. It's a, it's a rogue planet passing through the solar system. And, uh, but they do this all graphically. They can adjust these orbits, and we teach them how, what they need to do to patch from a, you know, orbits around the body to a hyperbolic departure and, um, and get on a, um, a home and transfer to the other body and then a hyperbolic arrival. And, um, and then they land on the planet. Well, they actually, in this one, they also do remote sensing. They, you know, they, they have to be in a good orbit to get, uh, be close enough and at a high enough inclination to scan the planet well. And that's all kind of scored. Uh, then they land on the planet and they learn about the difference between a spacecraft and an aircraft. There's actually an atmosphere on this planet. And so you have to take advantage of the aerodynamic drag to land before you run out of fuel. And uh, then they build a habitat. The parts for the habitat have to be carried by the spacecraft, so it's an iterative design process. If they don't have something they need, though they get penalized if their habitat, you know, if they had a greenhouse but there was not enough mass for that, well, sorry, you got to go back and redesign your spacecraft to carry the habit, the uh, greenhouse as well. And uh, finally, they do their final score is sort of a sustainability score. Like the goal is to be able to stay there forever. That's the highest. That's the best you could do. And um, they're doing a search and uh, for resources locally. They're teleoperating that robot, and they're going out and sampling and figuring out what resources are around the habitat. And uh, based on that result, they get a total sustainability, and they can find out how long they can stay there. If you do this really well, you can actually stay there forever, so just barely. So anyway, it's a collaboration and teamwork. It's remote. Uh, it's immersive. If they, get it, they get involved with the engineering design process and design and iteration. Oops, what did I do? Um, and I think I explained uh, basically all this already. Um, there's lectures on the different concepts. The whole, so this is kind of like an end-to-end -end mission, and all the concepts of that are that we have lessons on those, and then tutorials how to do those things inside the, the, the simulation tool, and um, and so on. So this has been really fun. This is so it's been a worldwide competition with prizes, and and we bring in guest speakers on all these topics uh, from JPL and NASA and uh, different different places, um, and. Um, uh, and then it's also running in, uh, in camps. So like, for example, last night we started one in New South Wales that's running through Wednesday. So there's one running right now. And um, we're also running it in schools directly. So uh, we have a NASA grant on this. I think that's the last point here. So we have a NASA grant to get this in 100 schools and reach 10,000 kids over the next couple of years. And uh, so, and we've been talking, uh, I've been talking to you guys a little bit about possibly doing this here. We, you know, our grant, our NASA grant covers Texas, Louisiana, and uh, New Mexico. But this is accessible. We, we want to reach as many schools as we can. So um, this is accessible and something we're happy to share. So, All right, I'm going to quickly go through this. Um, uh, there's actually, if you're interested in knowing more, there, there's a backup slides here on everything. Uh, that, and there's a PDF, which I sent to Alvar, which you, uh, which you guys can have and, and look through if you want to know more details about anything we have in here, the models we have, and so on. I'm just going to highlight a few things here. Uh, the fidelity of the space environment. I mean, since this is um, handling things within a whole solar system and there's communication involved, I mean, even for you know, GPS, you need to account for relativity. And so that's built into the models. There's multi, you, know, you can understand from different observer frames where things are. That's all, that's all built in. Um, super high fidelity gravity models, the best ones you could possibly run. Um, you know, the atmospheres are not, they're, they're, there aren't atmospheres on every object in the solar system, so you would have to add, so if you wanted uh, you know, an atmosphere on a, um, if you want a Titan's atmosphere, you'd have to put it in yourself. We don't have Titan's atmosphere, but um, for example. Um, but the planetary surfaces, all we have all the best data in there. And the, the, we've built this so it's, 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 it scales down uh, infinitely. So it really, the, 
the, the, the detail to which the surface uh, is, is rendered is a function of you know, the computer that you're using. So uh, you, can be, you can see the planet from orbit as you fly down all the way down to a pebble by your boot print if you're running it on a fast enough machine. Um, uh, I mentioned the, um, I'll skip this one. Uh, the code design, it's all parallel, multi-threaded, um, asynchronous and distributed, so basically it's fast. Um, and, but another thing about this is that it, if, if, for example, if you had a super high fidelity model of an F-15 running in you know, a simulation with a bunch of other things, and that model couldn't keep up you know, for some reason, with the, the, it's not gonna crunch the rest of the simulation. So every object is running in its own thread, and the rest of the sim doesn't care whether it produces the right answer or not. It'll just keep going. Um, and the other advantage of that is just the scalability. So what I'm showing you here, there's a few assets and places doing things, but you really could scale this up because it's running on a network. Any, any number of nodes could be running models and sharing the, the data. Um, and so it can scale up to a large number of assets uh, all running in the same sim. So that's why it can work for mission control to look, watch the space station, watch a habitat on the moon, watch a robotic uh, activity going on and so on. Uh, and as much as we didn't talk too much about this, it's, 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 there's many ways you can participate in this. I mean, you can be fully in VR for training, uh, maybe AR if you're on the lunar surface and you're uh, interacting with something um, like teleoperation and so on. Um, and uh, finally, it's fully programmable. So this is kind of like, if I had to describe this to you in one phrase, which I've, which I've taken a lot more than one phrase, <laughs> but if I had to describe this to you in one phrase, I would say the purpose is to be like the MATLAB of uh, space system design. So uh, you know, when you know, I mean, all of you know MATLAB, I think, or probably, um, you know, so it's fully programmable that way. You know, you know what you want to get out of it, you write the code to do, it, do what you want, and you don't really care how the function works, you just know it's gonna work and do it, give it what you want. Um, I think a bit more, like a, a little bit more like a printer in that the display environment, the graphic environment, also the simulation of the whole solar system is kind of like a printer. Um, I don't, as long as I see what I wanna see in Word, I trust the printer to print it out properly. And that's, so everything under the hood that you can't access is like what the printer does and you don't really care, as long as it prints it properly and you have access to every other feature programmably in Python or C++, and uh, lots of APIs to work with other things. So this is what it looks like uh, if you, this is how you can access it. So if you go to spaceteamspro.com, you'll get to uh, uh, our dashboard. If you make an account, you can do that right now if you wanted to, you, make, you just go, to, go there and make an account. Uh, you would have to, if, if you kept going, you would have to pay, um, so don't do that. <laughs> just uh, send an email to support at simdynamics.com. Um, mention UW and uh, UW and, and uh, we'll give you a free account. Uh, it's, it's in a beta phase, so I'm happy to give out accounts and just let people play with this and start using it to do things and hopefully collaborate with you and have some ideas about that. Um, and then there's a website with uh, instructional videos and, and stuff like that. So, and you can get the access to these slides or, or Alvar can distribute them. Um, so yeah, the last thing here is just that I think there's ways, you know, we can collaborate using this. That's what we would like to do and uh, we're doing that with a lo number of places. Um, but if, you know, if there's any uh, uh, mission or space flight uh, um, things you would like to simulate, then, you know, we can work with you and help you use this. Um, and, um, you know, if, if, it's, um, if there's a vehicle or habitat design evaluation, like we're running a program right now I think it ended last night. As, uh, there were 19 university teams doing a habitat design, uh, co competing using this. Um, you know, we can, um, uh, it can support that and we would be you know, happy to work with you on things like that. Um, uh, one of the applications that I'm excited about is uh, GNC testing. We're, we're running uh, models right now where we, um, we're trying to do lunar landing simulations using this with the uh, vision-based navigation. And um, so testing out a GNC algorithm for uh, landing on the moon. A lot of companies are going to be landing on the moon over the next decade or two. And um, this is a, I think, a, we think it's a good tool to be using for lunar landing testing. Um, um, we've, we have some hardware in the loop, so if there's hardware development and you want to test it in the simulation in the actual environment that's going to be used, that's something that uh, we can use this for and help you with. Um, mentioned design competitions. I'm using it already for capstone projects. Uh, we meant, I mentioned the STEM outreach, and uh, and also um, you know we are happy to you know collaborate on grant proposals with uh, with you guys if you're interested. 
Um, this is kind of like specifications if someone wants to look at some more details. Uh, I want to mention that, uh, just kind of a closing thing, I want to mention that, um, so um, uh, this is a book that I wrote and is part of our space operations course at, te at Texas A&M. Um, this was uh, basically lessons learned from operations for the last 60 years of space flight and a lot of, a lot of NASA folks have contributed to this, about 20 authors. There's also um, about 30 astronauts have contributed stories from orbit, uh, lessons learned to this. Uh, there's a course running for AIAA starting tomorrow uh, uh, based on this. You, you can still sign up for that if you're interested. Um, so it, you, can, you don't need to use the code. You can just um, type in AIAA and uh, human spaceflight operations, and you'll find it right away. Um, so that's starting tomorrow. And uh, you can still sign up. And even if you sign up late, the, the lectures are recording. It's running all the way to the end of June. It's every Tuesday, Thursday at 10 a.m. here. And, um, and then... The book is available from AIAA or Amazon, and um, so, so I have a copy of the book here, and this book is for you, Chrissy. Fantastic. Um, so this is, this is for the department, and, and so for you to circulate, anybody wants to look at it, um, use it, um, that's for you. And, um, and I'll, I'll just like to end here with uh, my, my, it's too bad there's so much light in the room. Um, this is a spectacular picture in the dark. But uh, my favorite picture of 22,000 and something that I took in space, um, we, are, we are really there in a big way. This is the window from the Japanese experiment module uh, looking kind of to the north. We're in a high inclination orbit, but it's on the north side of the space station. And um, this was my, this was my go-to every night before going to bed. I'd go to this window and just stare you know, at the world go by until I was forced to go to bed. And um, um, the, the amazing thing about this was that you know, it's really big. The space station, you know, uh, people, a lot of times it's funny when someone asks me, what's it like to be in such a small space with, you know, other people? This place is so big that you can't find your other crewmates sometimes. <laughs> you know, you have, it takes you five minutes to search for them. Um, it's a really big place, especially when there's three people on board. And um, it's just incredible that, you know, we're all working on the ground on all these things, and, you know, this is really going on. It's a real place. It's a real human experience, and it's, that's only going to grow. And um, a few people, like you, <laughs> are making it possible to put engines on this thing that can, you know, I, well, I, was, I was just wishing we could just light it up and take it to Mars, because this thing would work perfectly well in Mars orbit. The solar panels are, would work, turn off a few experiments, it'll work fine. And um, we just, you know, wanted this thing, wanted just to, to keep going. And um, so hopefully we will with, you know, with Artemis and, and beyond. So um, thank you guys very much. So. <laughs> I just have one more thing, if I oh. could give this to you. Heck yeah. Uh, it's just a reminder, it's just a Aww. memento from the, the last mission. And um, I can try to read it, but uh, to the faculty and students at UW, Aero, Aero Astro, best wishes. And awesome. So hopefully you can put that up somewhere. Yeah, we will absolutely do right. that. Thank Let me you. Put this somewhere safe. Uh, you can take it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have time for like two questions. Uh -huh. Who has a question? Jim. You, you talked about propulsion. So I'm curious, what, going, going back to the ISS, what do you have on board for propulsion for orbit keeping? It all belongs to the Russians, for one thing. Um, yeah, that's all, we, that's all we have. So uh, there's thrusters on the Russian side that, that do, you know, that are reboost thrusters. Everything else is at, attitude. Uh, it's mono, it's, um, but we have mono method. There, theirs is like dimethyl, uh, I, do you know exactly what it is? Dimethyl hydrogen something, yeah. It's like our, it's, it's not monomethyl hydrazine, it's dimethyl something similar. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, basically it's like that, yeah. yeah. Cool. And I saw that you have like relativistic physics in this simulation. What are the use cases you had in mind? Pointing, I think, you know, pointing was one of, was one of them. Uh, communication. Yeah, and things like GPS. Yeah, yeah. Knowing the time, knowing the, um, you know, the time delay and so on that between, yeah, observations and yeah. Uh, what do you think is the key characteristics, or technically and personally, that an astronaut would benefit the most? In terms of what qualities you would to have to be selected? To be selected. Yeah. And not only selected, in your opinion, given that you have the to be a successful astronaut. 
what did you do? Well, I, uh, what I can tell you, I guess maybe the, maybe the thing that I'm thinking about in your response is, you know, what characteristics have caused people not to fly or not to fly again, <laughs> oh, okay. right? And um, it really, teamwork is huge, uh, huge. I mean, I, I know that one of my classmates, I won't say who, but you know, his, he, he came in and said, you know, I'm gonna leave you in the dust. He said this to other people in the class. And, and that's not an attitude for, and I don't know how we got through the selection process with that attitude, but um, and the, another example, uh, you know, I, I remember a, a, a more senior person, um, you know, listening to a lecture. This was, so in, in Russia, you know, the, the, the discipline um, owners, right, are, are the experts. They've, had, they've dedicated their whole life to certain systems and they are, the, you know, they're an expert on the system. They have one disciple that's growing up underneath them and is going to eventually be the one person who's really the expert on that system. And, um, and so, like, just kind of bow to these folks who, the, they are the, you know, for example, the GNC expert, you know, in Russia who trains the crew. You know, that's somebody who deserves a lot of your respect. I don't care how much you know about GNC, right? And I, and, uh, I, I saw one crew member who was selected for long duration space flight and sitting in a class went with a translator and as this, as this instructor is teaching, he's interrupting and saying, I know, I know, this is just like this. I know, we just skip that, I, I already know that. And, and uh, he never flew, so. <laughs> Yeah, so there's definitely, you know, a, a bit of a, uh, you know, I, it, this is, okay, th this is, this brings up, you know, kind of a, a personal philosophy, which to me, I don't know why I do this, but I've always treated everybody like a teacher. I've, every, you know, every single person can teach you something. And maybe it's what not to do, <laughs> but every single person can teach you something. And uh, I think that's an important way to look at, you know, world, because especially as a crew member, all day long, every day, you're moving between people who have something to teach you, and they and you have to give them the the honor of the, and the respect that they deserve for whatever it is they're going to share with you, their wisdom, their knowledge, um, and it's a, so there's a that's an attitude thing. And in terms of preparation, um, um, as I mentioned to some other folks who brought this up today, this is um, different, maybe different from other careers, a little bit different. Is just the the operational experience, op operations, and so not just you know, programming on a computer, but getting in the lab and picking up the, a wrench, doing work with actual equipment. Because most of the time, what we did up there was fix things. <laughs> so, right, so, yeah. All right. All right, so thank, thank you. Thank you very much.